money is haram, it's fiat money. But I wanted to ask you, at what point did it become haram? Was it when it was removed from the gold standard? And if so, what year was that? The second question I have... Wait, to one at a time. The question is, when did money become haram? At one point in time. And the answer is that to understand the process, you have to first understand a new actor on the stage of the world. Emerged out of nowhere and takes control of the world, modern Western civilization. And this civilization, thank Allah, is about to be destroyed in the new war, in the world war that's coming now. Read Surah Al Rahman and you'll get the guidance in Surah Al Rahman. And this civilization has within it Gog and Magog, Yajuj and Majuj. And they are the ones who commit fasad. Fasad is that which corrupts and destroys. Inna Yajuja wa Majuja mufsiduna fil up. There are those, and there are many, who believe that Gog and Magog will only be released at that time when Nabi Isa alayhi salam returns. And they are going to have the surprise of their life in the grave for their betrayal and their disrespect for the Quran. So let them remain with their views. They don't want to change. Good. Gog and Magog are in modern Western civilization. And they have this capacity to commit facade, to corrupt and destroy. And one of the things, one of the most important things of all that they corrupted was money. Money. The first stage of the process was the colonization. They colonized India, for example. And when they colonized India, they found India using gold and silver coins. And the ulama of India supported and defended the dinar and dirham. But nobody remembers that now, of course. And then, while the British were ruling over India, they then introduced the paper money. And they were insisting that the paper money is redeemable in gold and therefore it's halal. <coughs> there were those of the ulama of India who recognized in which way the wind was blowing. They were men of insight. And they were also men of backbone. And that's what the fast of Ramadan is supposed to do. It's supposed to give you insight and it's supposed to give you backbone. So if the day of Eid comes and you still have the same as you were at the beginning, no insight and no backbone, only recycled paper, your fasting has not delivered anything. Hmm? When they brought in the paper money, some of the ulama of India stood up courageously and denounced it and insisted you have to remain with dinar, which is in the Quran, and dirham, which is in the Quran. But there were prominent ulama, and I don't want to mention any name. I don't want to, to embarrass anyone. There were prominent ulama who supported the paper money, even wrote books to support the paper money. Yeah. The paper money was codified in a system in 1944. Prior to that, Britain was doing what she wanted to do wherever she had her colonies. She, she, she established her own money wherever she had a colony. And the money was supposed to help her to become richer. So the money was going to support the, the suctioning, suctioning of money from the colonies to Britain. And then came the Second World War, and that stopped now. And in the Second World War, you now have the systemization of the monetary system at a place called Bretton Woods. You know the subject. 
And in Bretton Woods, they decided that only one currency would be redeemable in gold, the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar used to be traded at $20 for one ounce of gold. You could take 20 U.S. dollars to any bank and you'll get a gold, an ounce of gold, $20. Sounds like Santa Claus stuff now, doesn't it? $20, yeah? And then came 1933, and the U.S government banned the use of gold, banned it. You can't keep gold. You can't use gold as money. You could keep jewelry, yes, but not gold coins and not gold bars and not gold certificates. You have to give it to the government at 20, at 20. And if you are caught after a certain time, you go to jail for six months or you pay $10,000 and fine. And after the American people had sold all their gold or transferred all their gold for paper at 20, then the US government removed the ban, but changed the value of the paper. It's no longer 20, it's now 35. So the American people were ripped off 41% of, of their gold, just like that. Okay, that was the opening rounds, the opening rounds, 1933. And then after that came 1944 with the Bretton Woods Accord. And uh, then came the International Monetary Fund. And only one currency in the world is now redeemable in gold, and that's the US dollar at $35 an ounce. But not you and I. We can't do it, only a, central bank, only a central bank. And all the rest of the paper money in the world, including, including, including the Islamic Republic of Pakistan. That's right. And the Pakistani feel that I'm anti-Pakistani. No, I'm, I'm, I'm anti-nonsense. And I'm anti-betrayal of the Quran. That's what I am. Betraying the Quran. From day one to this day, up to now, Pakistan is betraying the Quran. Yes. The Pakistani rupee has no relationship with gold, never had and will never have. And you say you have ulama. It was just paper, that's all. But the relationship is with the US dollar. So when I reached Pakistan as a student in 19... 64. I spent one year at Al Azhar, 63 to 64, and then I left Al Azhar and I went to Pakistan, and that was the best decision I've ever made in my life. To leave Al Azhar University and go to study with Maulana Fadlur Rahman Ansari in Pakistan. The best decision I have ever made in life. Yes. One US dollar was one rupee 75 pesos. And you used to have Chawani and Atani. Now you don't know what's Chawani, <laughs> you don't know what's Atani. And uh, today, instead of one US dollar being one rupee 75, it is how much? 45. 145. Yeah, and still they have peanuts in their head. Is it peanuts they have in their head or is it potato chips they have in their head? It doesn't matter to me if people become annoyed with me. No, it doesn't matter to me at all. If one voice has to stand up and say, I'm going to say it. That's why I can't visit Pakistan, no. I would love to go to visit Pakistan, but I say it's no longer the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, it's the Islamic Republic of shoeshine boys of Muhammad bin Salman. You think I could go to Pakistan after saying that? No, I prefer. I prefer to die without ever returning to Pakistan, but to have the freedom to speak the truth. Yes. They remained with that rotten system until 1971. It was Charles de Gaulle, not any Maulana, not any Mufti. 
It was Charles de Gaulle, who in 1966 in the French National Assembly, he stood up and he denounced the system. And then long years later came Dr. Mahathir. Hmm. But before them, there was one man in, Sing in Indonesia. Nobody remembers him today, Ahmad Sukarno. And those who remember him usually laugh at him. They laugh at him because Sukarno took Indonesia out of the IMF. That's right. And these, excuse my language, these donkeys laugh at him because they got their PhD for some British university or American university and become our leaders. Sukarno took Indonesia out of the UN and took Indonesia out of the IMF and on judgment day I pray that Allah may bless him for that. Okay? But then came de Gaulle and when de Gaulle challenged them in the French National Assembly then the Zionists took over and they removed de Gaulle. He lost the election. And then in 1971, the French government continued the policies of de Gaulle of redeeming U.S. dollars for gold. But because of the Vietnam War, which was not fought, was not fought against the communists in Vietnam. That's the window dressing. <laughs> the Vietnam War, for, the Vietnam War was fought so they could get an excuse to print more paper. Far, far, far more paper than they had gold. And de Gaulle could see it, but our Maulanas couldn't see it, no. And when he denounced them, he started redeeming US dollars for gold. You're not supposed to do that. And when they realized this is dangerous, if he keeps on doing this, we don't have enough gold for the paper we printed. If I do that, they put me in jail. But Uncle Sam does that, does that. All he has to do is what Nixon did in 1971. Nixon said, we gave our word, but we don't have to keep our word. We gave our word under international law that in this monetary system which we have established, the United States government commits itself to redeem US dollars for gold at the rate of $35 for one ounce of gold. We gave that promise, but we don't have to keep it. That's the great United States of America. Yes. And since 1971, the US dollar went into no man's land. It started dropping from 35 to 40. And then in 1973, they were able to solve the problem with the Arab-Israeli war. And then King Faisal imposed the oil boycott. And what happened? The price of oil went up by 400%. And the value of the US dollar collapsed by 400%. That is what Kissinger wanted. And when Kissinger saw that, and the Arabs are now four times more wealthy, then he flew to Riyadh and he fooled Faisal because Faisal had only peanuts in his head. May Allah have mercy on him. He was a better man, but he still had peanuts in his head. And Faisal agreed. Kissinger said, what you're getting is peanuts. If you will commit yourself to sell oil for only US dollars, that's all you have to do. You become fabulously wealthy. And Kissinger was speaking the truth. So then came the birth of the petrodollar. And where is it in the Hadith? It's there in Sahih Bukhari. Yes. The reason why I was able to interpret the Hadith is because I had studied international monetary economics before studying the Quran and Hadith. That's why I could, rec I could recognize this Hadith about the mountain of gold. We don't have the time to explain that now. And so the US dollar became a petrodollar. And since then it has been flying high. And the United States becoming fabulously, fabulously, fabulously wealthy. 
But who in the United States is getting wealthy? The rich. And the rest of the American people are just like garbage. Yeah. And this system of riba sucking the wealth. So that now in the United States of America, you have some parts of the United States, like, like Liari in Pakistan, <laughs> yes. with poverty. But the system is going to collapse because of the Hadith, that they will fight for the mountain of gold. What is to come after that? Of course it's bogus, of course it's fraudulent, of course it's haram. It is a system which is sucking the wealth of mankind. That's why you have all the refugees here. Kashmir is so beautiful. But you have to leave Kashmir to come here to live comfortably. Egypt is a lovely land. The Egyptian would love to be back in Egypt, his native Egypt. The Moroccan would love to be back in Morocco. The Bangladeshi would love to be back in Chittagong, Silet. Huh? Me, I would love to have the Afghan land and chicken tikka. Oh yeah. The roadside restaurant, you eat maybe those days two rupee for a naan. I don't know how much it is now. And it tastes so good. But everybody have to leave now. And the refugees, they're all economic refugees, are all descending upon the West because this is where the money is. And over there becoming destitution. This is riba. This is because of riba. But now they're finished with paper money. So they brought cryptocurrencies to destabilize national currencies. Okay. And after they destabilized the national currencies, the US dollar, the euro, the greatest the sterling pound and so on, you make the way incrementally, incrementally to one currency for all of mankind. And they will control the currency in Jerusalem. And the state of Israel will rule the world. If you rule the world of money, you rule the world. Is that so difficult to understand? Is there anyone in Britain teaching the subject? Even if I, ask, I offer to teach the subject to them, so they can teach it to others, they still would not come to me to learn from me. Next question. Um, you said that uh, you see Pakistan being dragged into the big war. No. The present government of India is a war-mongering government. It, is, it has hatred for Islam embedded in its heart. And it is a friend and ally of Israel. But not all Hindus are like that. Why is it so difficult for the Muslim to understand you don't lump all Hindus with the government of India. Eh? Proper following of the Sunnah of the Prophet is to make an initiative that will change your strategic environment. And you'll find large numbers of Hindus who will now show more respect for Islam. If you would say, that Hindu India never invited the Muslims to come and rule over them. No. It was Islamic imperialism. It was bogus jihad. So call a spade a spade. And when you denounce Muslim rule over Hindu India for so many centuries, and you apologize for it, as we have denounced Ottoman rule over the Orthodox Christians for so many centuries. And all the pain inflicted on those Christians. We said, this is not Islam. And we say, when we conquer Constantinople, we're going to return Hagia Sophia to you. Now look at the Orthodox Christian world. They are changing. They're becoming more friendly to us. I can go there amongst them and preach Islam. If you do the same thing with Hindu India, then you, they, I don't know, they, don't have, they have only peanuts in their head. That they cannot understand proper strategy. Proper strategy is to follow the Sunnah. To show Islam as a peace-loving religion. We don't want war. Yes. 
And if you do that, then there'll be large numbers of Hindus who will oppose their government. So actually, it is a warmongering Hindu government in <coughs> India which is lusting for war in Pakistan. That's right. Go ahead. So, so my question was, do you see any other army, being Muslim army, trying to gather with Orthodox Christians, such as Russians, fighting in the Big World War? The question is, do you see Pakistan shaking hands with the Russia and fighting in the Big World War? The leadership of Russia has something called insight that Islamabad doesn't have. There are Christians in Russia today who have insight. They're conducting the best foreign policy in the whole world today, Russia. Okay? And America is looking like garbage compared to Russia. Yeah. When Russia sees Pakistan sitting on the fence, it hurt Saudi Arabia, would hurt Iran. <laughs> Sitting on the fence. And you read out the red carpet for Mohammed bin Salman just to get money. Russia would know I cannot trust such a people. Russia will trust Ayatollah Khamenei. When Putin went to Iran, he didn't bother with Rouhani. He went to Ayatollah Khamenei. And he remained with him for hours. Ayatollah Khamenei controls the Iranian armed forces. This is a man I can trust. When Russia returned to Christianity, the, the Chinese looked at Russia and said, now we can trust them. They couldn't trust the Soviet Union. So when India attacks Pakistan, it's only a matter of time. There is no way that Pakistan can win that war. You can fire off a few nuclear weapons and so on, kill a few million people and so on, but at the end of the day, Pakistan cannot win that war unless China intervenes to help Pakistan. This is why Pakistan has had this relationship with China for 50, 60 years now. Will China intervene militarily? Huh? You've not studied. You've not done your homework. The only way that China will intervene to assist Pakistan if India attacks is if Russia also intervenes. Then China will intervene. Will Russia intervene? You're living in dreamland if you believe that Russia will intervene. Huh? Pakistan has made a mess of their foreign policy. Mess because they've lost Russia. They've lost Russian trust with their foreign policy. That's it. Next question. Sheikh, um, forgive my ignorance on this subject. My question is on China. Um, I wanted to know, you praise Russia's alliance with China. What's your view, what's your take on the persecution of the Uyghurs, Muslims in China? I will only make a comment when I have knowledge. And when it comes to the jihad in the Caucasus, the Chechenia, and the jihad in uh, the Yugas and so on in China, the information only comes to me from the CIA. And the only time the CIA has ever spoken the truth, you know, the CIA spoke the truth once, only once. They said it was Mohammed bin Salman. <laughs> He's the one who ordered the killing of Adnan Khashoggi. This is the one time the CIA spoke the truth. So I will have to get credible information for me to comment. Any more questions? You already had one question, yeah? Uh, sorry, please. Um, I'm 77 and my hearing is not good. <laughs> yes. Uh, is this the job going to be uh, um, from the human race? Because okay. we have different opinions in the scholars. Okay. There's a book coming. It's already written. <laughs> it's already published in Pakistan, um, in Malaysia, printed. It'll be here shortly. Uh, the Jal, sorry, the Quran, the Jal, and the Jasad, which is the answer to your question. But you can go to my website, imranhussein.org, and download the book, and you'll get the answer. Yes. Sorry. Your first question? Yes. Sure, okay. <laughs> I just talking about uh, Riba earlier. 
I am quite familiar with your views on uh, riba. Go ahead. However, mm -hmm. living in the non-Muslim society, I wanted to see the permissibility factor, if there is one, uh, for using riba, using riba for buying the house, for example, or mortgage. Okay. The question is, um, if we are living in a non-Muslim country, uh, can we can we have any leeway to buy a house even with riba? The answer is it makes no difference whether you're living in India and Pakistan or you're living in Britain. Huh? Makes no difference. Same amount of riba out there. Same amount of riba over here. Okay. Except that over there is a little bit more dangerous than here. Because over here you have a curious thing called the Islamic Bank. And the Islamic Bank is worse than the commercial bank. Because the Islamic Bank is giving you riba through the back door. Whereas the commercial bank is giving you riba through the front door. Okay? If you do not understand what I'm talking about, go to my website and read, read my essays on the subject. Uh, one second. The law permits you to eat pork if you have no food. It's called the law of darura or the law of necessity. It's there in the Quran. But if you have to buy a house because of Darura, if. Are you going to fill the plate with pork? Or will you eat the minimum amount of pork possible just to survive? They are misusing the law of necessity. They don't care about eating the minimum amount of pork. They want the biggest house they can get. Yes? That's not the law of the rural. Number two, when you're eating the pork, should you be enjoying the pork and licking your finger? And be proud of this house that you bought? And boasting to all of Pindi, I bought this house, look at the picture. You're licking your finger while eating the pork. And number three, while you are eating the pork, you must be looking for food and searching for food. And on the day when you get the food, you stop eating the pork. But you sign an agreement, 25 years of pork. You think you're fooling Allah? Huh? Number four. Is it possible to rent a place and pay your landlord's riba for him? Hmm? Yes, this is indirect riba. You're, play, you're paying your landlord's riba for him. But when you borrow the money on interest and you sign, you are directly in riba. So in a choice between the two evils, which one is the lesser evil? Nabi Muhammad said, when you're faced with two evils, then you should choose the lesser evil. And then let me remind you how your dada used to build a house. Dada Abba will build one room. <laughs> yes. And when he has enough money, he put another room. My father died when I was 15 years of age. My mother didn't like the place where we were living. We had a plot of land and the government gave us some money when my father died. And she was able to build a house, but no money to put the windows. And we moved into the house with no windows, just the door in the back. <laughs> yeah. And I saw people living like that. They would use a sugar bag before plastic came. They will use the sugar bag, the jute bag, as windows to cover the window. But now you want the whole thing built. And yes, you have to open the door. You and Begum Sahaba and the children. <laughs> 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 
Stop playing games. This is, this is not permissible in Islam. If Allah had made it haram, it is haram. Okay? And this bogus fatwa, that the first house is permissible. <laughs> but after that, no more. Some of them have died now. The ulama who gave this fatwa. I pity them in the grave. I pity them, yes. I pity them in the grave. Uh, shall we take one more? One more? Two more, three more. That's it. Okay? Agreed? Four more. Agreed? Only four? Right, thank you. One, two, three, four. Good. Uh, thank you for gracing us with your presence here today. Um, you paint quite a bleak picture of all the uh, Islamic or so-called Islamic nations around the world, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, uh, Turkey, etc. Are there any nation states or leaders which you see some beacon of light or something aspirational? Because it's all kind of... Yes. I am a student of international relations, international affairs. So I, end, I study world politics and I recognize that there is a global system which is oppressive, oppressive, oppressing mankind. And that anyone who refuses to bend your knee before them you become a rogue state and they wage war on you. So I look favorably, I look admirably at those who refuse to bend their knee. And this is why Hugo Chavez is a, Hugo, is a hero for me. Nicolas Maduro, they're just nine miles from me. I'm in Trinidad in Venezuela. They are heroes because they refuse to bend their knee. I don't see amongst your so-called Muslim leaders, I don't see anyone who acts the way Chavez acted. When Israel was murdering the people in Gaza, Chavez responded better than any Muslim leader attended. He denounced the, Saudi, the Israeli government. He did, broke diplomatic relations. He expelled the Israeli ambassador. Bolivia, under Evo Morales, shows more backbone, refuses to bow. In Bolivia. Hmm? South America is a fertile. Yeah, I'm mentioning two countries, yeah. They're trying to overthrow uh, Maduro. Look at Mexico. Mexico standing firm. Yes. Uh, the governments of the Caribbean, I, I was proud to see the governments of the Caribbean, including my own Trinidad and Tobago, standing up to the United States. That's why the United States could not intervene militarily in Venezuela so far. Now look, when we look to the world of Islam, who do we see who refuse to bend their knee? With all the mistakes that Muammar Ghazafi made, as much a clown as he was, the reason why they removed him was because he refused to bend his knee. With all the bad things that Saddam Hussein did, and he did so many bad things that when I met Sheikh Abdul Hamid Kishk, the blind Sheikh in Egypt, Abdul Hamid Kishk said to me about Saddam, he said, Shaitan al Akbar. <laughs> <laughs> but the reason why they removed Saddam Hussein was because in the end of his life he refused to bend his knee. So I have to recognize the value of these men. Ahmad Sukhano was removed because he refused to bend his knee. Yes. Muhammadu Buhari, who is now the president of Nigeria, the first time he was president, they removed him because he refused to bend his knee. Bashir, Bashar Assad has demonstrated greater integrity, greater backbone than all the rest. Because Bashar Assad has stood firm, they tried everything they could possibly try, and they failed. 
But the two most, the three most important countries in the world which have refused to bend their knees are Russia, China, and Iran, more Khamenei than Rouhani. Next question, number two. Assalamualaikum. Where were you born? Where were you born? Libya. Libya. Yeah. Oh, I could see. <laughs> Go ahead. I do recognize the fact that the Ottomans, I said, I do recognize the fact that the Ottomans committed much hostility against the Orthodox Christians, and I really support your idea of giving back Hagia Sophia to the Orthodox Christians. But where do you come with the idea of that Christianity is still valid today, despite the fact that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu he was the last of the prophets, and one of the last ayahs of the Quran, وَمَنْ يَبْتَغِي غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا فَلَنْ يُقْبَلْ مِنْ Wouldn't it be, if we understand Christianity today, if we take it as valid, it will discredit Prophet Muhammad and his message. In fact, I believe when Jesus السلام, comes back, I think he wouldn't come as a prophet. No, no, enough. I don't want you to go any further. What you have to do is to come and spend some time in my company. Yes, because it's, I, I can't respond to you. I'm going to take two hours. I, can't I have to take two hours to respond to you. I've been reading the Quran. Yes, yes. No, no. I don't want you to go further because you've already made some significant statements that you'll probably not want to make after we sit down and talk. Okay? So let's leave your question until we can meet. Sorry. Number three. Uh, uh, You're speaking too softly. Where were you born? Uh, Tunisia. Tunisia. Good. For a poor country in Africa that need to uh, build infrastructure. Come closer to me. Yeah. A poor country in Africa that need to build infrastructure and they, are, they don't have the basic needs. And uh, the only way for them to build that infrastructure is either they have the knowledge and they have university to have, uh, to have university, or they, they borrow to actually do that. What is the solution for them? Had the ulama of Islam not betrayed the religion, we would not be in the mess in which we are today. I don't know if you can find in Tunisia ulama who have declared that the money which you are using in Tunisia is bogus, it's fraudulent and it's haram. The subject is not taught in Jamiatul Azhar, it is not taught in the Darul Ulum. The Mufti graduates after 12 years of studies and he knows nothing of the subject and yet he gives the fatwa. Not only is Tunisia going to remain poor, but the bad news is you're going to become poorer tomorrow until your people are living in destitution. That's what's happening in the United States now. Yes, in the United States, the suction pump has taken wealth out of the people for to such an extent that there are millions in the United States now who are living on the streets. Yeah, so that suction pump will continue to take the wealth of Tunisia. There's no hope for you to rebuild and become a better tomorrow. Rather, you have to prepare for a slavery which is coming ahead of you, unless you can get the ulama of Islam to wake up. That's why our Prophet said, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, the hadith is in the Sunnah of Bayhaqi. يُوشِكُ وَيَأْتِي عَلَى النَّاسِ الزَّمَنِ لَا يَبْقَى مِنَ الْإِسْلَامِ إِلَّا اسْمُهُ وَلَا يَبْقَى مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ إِلَّا رَسْمُهُ Meaning, the Qur'an is there, but you're not studying it. No. مَسَاجِدُهُمْ أَمِيرَةٌ وَهِيَ خَرَابُ مِنَ الْهُدَى Now listen to the last piece. عُلَمَاؤُهُمْ شَرُّ النَّاسِ مِمَّنْ تَحْتَ أَدِيمِ السَّمَاءِ 
min indihim takhrujul fitna wa fihim ta'ud that is where we are today that is why i don't see any hope no i only see slavery coming up slavery coming up unless we can bring a new generation of scholars of islam and that's why i'm in britain that's why i'm struggling in britain because i've found about the young men here who were born in britain born here so they've studied they know western civilization and who have graduated from the darul ulum but who have not been brainwashed who are willing to think they're flocking to me they are attracted to my thought i said but wait i never saw this in pakistan i never saw it in malaysia but i'm seeing it in britain so there was something different here hmm? so that's why i'm returning to britain not too regularly because i don't want the british government to become too worried but i'm actually fishing fishing for a new generation of scholars of islam would be able to return to the Quran and study the Quran as it ought to be studied if you read my books you will see that i am studying the Quran differently from the darul ulum and the last book i have written which is not here yet is still to come on the on the Quran the jal and the jasad i wrote that book to challenge the darul ulum that's right I said come on come on to the darul ulum come on show me your way of preaching and teaching the Quran and my way look at the difference next 1 2 3 4 4 last one assalam alaikum thank you very much for coming alaikum assalam and i pray and where were you born uh, i'm from pakistan lahore uh half yeah partly from lahore and partly from jhelum jhelum okay lahore to lahore So I have uh, one confirmation actually. You know, I used to tell him in Lahore. Mm-hmm. I said the gadha and the mitti, mm-hmm. the dust of the road of Lahore, is more precious to me than the skyscrapers of Manhattan. This was when I was living in New York. <laughs> Yeah, I have one confirmation actually and one question and somebody asked you a few years back uh, about the great war and about the great war mal- malhama the malhama and remember i'm like a schoolboy my knowledge is slowly increasing so i make mistakes and i have to correct myself yeah go ahead yeah he asked you about uh, what he should do he was from london and you suggested you should leave london and move to countryside Yes, I still say that. Yes, uh, I still say that. Meant to be in an Islamic country as well. I don't know whether there's an Islamic country. <laughs> okay. I don't know. <laughs> so I think you meant to Yeah, go yes. The, when the great war takes place. It's going to be nuclear war. Even if a nuclear bomb does not fall on London. The lines of supply for electricity for water for food will all be disrupted london by itself cannot feed itself when you no longer have electricity you no longer have water you no longer have food you're going to have anarchy people are going to become like animals from the time there is a suspicion that you have food in your house suspicion eh? or you have water in your house they'll come and break down there'll be no police to help you break down your door and if you show resistance they'll kill you because they're searching for food and water will you keep your wife and children in such a situation is that amount all the amount of sense you have okay you should not allow the great war to occur and you do not have some place in the countryside put aside even if it's a little shack a little shack and you have enough gas in your tank to be able to drive there and take your family out quickly out of the city because if you remain in the city remember what allah says in surah al-isra وَإِن مِّن قَرْيَةٍ إِلَّا 
نحن مهلكوها قبل يوم القيامة أو أو معذبوها عذابا شديدا. That when the great war takes place, is not only all the towns and cities which will be destroyed. Some of them will not be destroyed, but punished with great punishment. This is the punishment. This is the punishment. So I say, if you could leave the Western world, I call it Monkey Town. Read my book Constantinople in the Quran, and you'll understand what is Monkey Town, because Monkey Town is going to be destroyed. But one of the nice things about living the religious way of life is we are not afraid to die. We are not afraid to die, even if we are in located at a particular time and we die in the war. We don't, we're not afraid to die. Once you walk in the straight path with Allah, you're not afraid to die. Okay. But the best way to deal with the the great war is to make hijra out of the West. But I know nobody's going to listen to me. <laughs> I know because I've been saying it for years now. They've come here to stay. I say, okay, the next best thing is to leave the cities and retreat to the remote countryside, but remain in small communities and produce your own food and learn how to survive economically. There's a Swiss scholar. His name is Piero San Giorgio. Piero San Giorgio. He wrote to me. He said, Sheikh, I'm secular. You religious. How come we came to the same conclusions? <laughs> so we arranged to meet. He traveled to Malaysia and he met me there. And then I came to Switzerland and we had a joint session in Switzerland and so on. He wrote a book. Surviving Economic Collapse. Good book to read. All right, I think we've had enough questions. And we my question is there, actually. It was a confirmation I just want to confirm. So the, my question is, uh, uh, is it the responsibility of every Muslim to implement the Islamic uh, system? And uh, to what extent? Is it Farz, Wajib, Anafar? And if it is yes, and then how? I have already answered you, in fact that the ordinary Muslim does not have the same role to play in the Ummah of Muhammad as the Alim, the scholar. He is the one. Our Prophet has said, Al-Ulama'u wa rasatul anbiya. The same way that the Prophets of Allah stood up with insight and with backbone, with insight and with backbone, and they changed the movement of history. Okay. Uh, we had an alim like that in Bangladesh. Today, even the Bengali doesn't know him. I have to tell them about Maulana Abdul Hamid Khan Bhashani. I have to tell them about him. <laughs> about Ubaidullah Sindhi. <laughs> the Pakistani doesn't know about these men. Um, Muhammad Ali Jauhar studied in Cambridge. But Muhammad Ali Jauhar was a man with backbone. Yes. These were men who stood up. Maulana Abdul Bari, who was the head of the Khilafat movement, was a formidable man when Gandhi came to him. And Gandhi said to him, you want the same thing that I want. We want the British out. I'm prepared to make an alliance with you. The Hindu came to the Muslim, eh? The Muslim didn't go. The Hindu came to the Muslim. This is not representative of a people with hatred in their hearts. And this is the leader of the Hindus. The leader, Jawaharlal Nehru, is a secular nationalist. But, ne but Gandhi is a Hindu at heart. The difference between the two men. And when Gandhi came to Maulana Abdul Bari, said, you want the same thing that I want. We want the British out. And when the British out, we want to live as Hindus and you want to live as Muslims, so let's make an alliance. <coughs> Abdul Bari was happy. Abdul Bari was happy. Then Gandhi said, I have only one condition, stop killing the cow. Stop killing the cow. Bari said, okay. Yes, we stop killing the cow. <laughs> 
We had men at that time who were ulama. I honor them, I respect them. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot change the condition of this ummah today. Unless and until you can produce a new generation of ulama, of scholars of Islam. This is what my teacher, blessed memory, Mulana Fadr Rahman Ansari, he came to that conclusion. And he established the institute where I studied. And his purpose was to try to build a new generation of ulama, and I represent the fruit of his effort. If you are to change the condition of the people, you have to produce this kind of ulama. Thank you very much for being with me. Tonight, make dua. I have a lot of countries to travel to. Yes, but I'll be back in Britain, inshallah, the beginning of September. And I may be back again in this masjid. ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت سميع العليم وتوب علينا يا مولانا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم برحمةك يا أرحم الراحمين آمين. And thank you, Imam, for your kind invitation. Yes. Yeah. Okay.